Hello, welcome to Isaris Vlog number 12. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, producing your own music as a band or artist and then we're going to go on and talk about Porcupine Trees in Absentia album. There it is. So, uh, as a brief overview, we're going to talk about like, the, the definition of what um, a producer actually is, um, what they do, um, and then give some examples of you know, some tasks that might be um, completed by the producer, and then give some examples well, of famous producers. Yeah. Well, one thing is there's kind of a few different types of producers, and it's changed over time. Like, a producer can be more of just an executive producer, i.e. Right? they're... they're <coughs> in control of planning and the finances of a session and responsible basically for getting the recording made, for getting it done. That's the kind of more uh, corporate executive type producer. Whereas in more modern times, something's come up which is the music producer, which is much more a creative role and in um, involved in the music, even to the point of arrangement and sound design and helping you know even as far as with lyrics or whatever or just it choosing musicians things like that so it's quite a broad um range role to be to, yeah to say a, a producer and it does get divided up now to executive and music producers sometimes yeah executive and producer often basically means that you know you're, you you control the finances and of the project effectively mm. and and um, well and the kind of schedule and um, and all the sessions, you know, booking everything in, all the kind of logistics, basically. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the role of a producer just generally, I think. Mm. Um, so a producer can kind of vaguely be uh, compared to a director of a film. And the producer's job is basically to bring everything together to create an album, to basically fulfil the vision of the album, you know, that can be being involved in actual structuring of songs and even musical ideas, ideas of layering different sounds, of uh, recording, you know, techniques for recording, um, and basically getting the band in the studio <coughs> when they have to be, getting them out of their drunken haze or whatever it is that's going on in the band, um, and into the studio on time, booking things, I suppose. Mm. Uh, just you know, generally running the show and making sure that everything happens, and you end up with an album. Well, yeah, I think I mean, like I was saying at the start, it's kind. Of, I think the roles changed over time and become more of a um, artistic kind of role in a way, because um, most producers now are very much involved in the the music itself, as opposed to producing the record. If that makes sense, you know, like not facilitating the album being made, but actually working on the album, I suppose, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. I mean, basically working with the band. It's, yeah. The idea is to get the best out of the, out of the artists, mm -hmm. to get, you know, the album that's kind of in there, that's started to be created out of them, and into this, a CD, or, you know, a release, an album, basically. One of the... Um um, most interesting things I've seen of showing a producer working is actually Lamb of God. Yeah. Um, when they released, uh, when they were recording Sacrament, and a guy called Machine um, yeah, produced yeah. it. And the way he works with all of the band, really, but especially with Randy Blythe, the singer, it's like you yeah. can see him just getting the performance out of him. It's really, it's really good. Yeah. There's um, a documentary, like an hour long documentary that's on the with the sort of deluxe expanded CD version of it, and I think it's on one of the DVDs they released as well. Uh, I can't remember which now, but uh, it's worth watching to kind of see a producer sort of actually in action kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. No, I agree. I, I think that's that's absolutely right. Because he gets really involved, and it's the same with Bob Rock as well, actually. <coughs> Bob Rock's another... I was just about to say that, you know, working with James Hetfield. So... <laughs> You know, they're, they're in the rehearsals and they're kind of, you know, giving feedback and, you know, trying to get the best out of, out of the artists, basically. And, and just, I, I view it as keeping an overview, keeping oversight on everything that's going on and fitting the pieces together 
and and making sure that everything kind of fits together in the best way possible. Yeah. And then um, also contributing something else. Yeah. You know? Well, so, sometimes it can be. Um, in a way, the the producers one of the main visionaries in the way that they're kind of um, putting it all together almost you know to the point of choosing songs or parts or you know really kind of having that kind of objective overview that, yeah. to help the band kind of create the best they can. Mm -hmm. um, another example of that is uh, Blackwater Park that we um, reviewed last time mm -hmm. um, which Stephen Wilson from Porcupine Tree produced yep. and also mixed. Um, and his involvement with Opeth definitely made that album, as we said in that um, review, much better than it probably would have been, I think. He, yeah. he had a very big role in the music itself, you know, even to the point he actually sung on some stuff. Yeah. Um, and definitely got really, really into the, mm. uh, the writing and especially the sound design, which is what Stephen Wilson's naturally master of. Yeah, layering sounds, yeah. you know. So effectively, it's quite a broad role, really. Oh yeah, huge. And then, and then you got producers who are like specialists in the area. So you can have like uh, a pop artist, uh, let's say like Rihanna, who works. I don't know why I gave an example, but who who works with uh, one vocal producer, and that mm. producer will be the vocal producer for that person. Yeah, yeah. And they will get the sound out of them and they'll work with them over time and sort of well, I suppose refine they, their sound. they build up a relationship with them and it, it's probably a lot of it as well as the artist being comfortable around that person because obviously um, making music or performing is quite a personal introspective thing in a way so if you're with other people you have to be comfortable with them and mm. um, they have to be there for a reason, I suppose, you know, if they're going to get the best out of you. I think often producers will also kick the asses, kick the band's asses or the artist's asses when necessary to get yeah. the, ne the required performances mm -hmm. out of them. So, some examples of some producers. you got, as we said, Stephen Wilson, um, and then uh, Bob Rock, uh, Machine. Those guys are, are awesome. Um, and then you got, like, uh, Rick Rubin. And he's a very different kind of producer because he's totally um, hands off. He's more of a um, he just gives opinions and his kind of views on how things should be and stuff. But he's not in any way musically or technically involved. So he, yeah. he never touches a mixing desk and he he can't play an instrument. I don't mm. think he's a musical at all. He's just there as a kind of uh, filter, I suppose, in a way like a visionary kind of. Mm. overview of stuff mm. yeah because some producers will get involved in the engineering side of things yeah, yeah well uh, oftentimes a lot of producers mix as well you know it's, mm -hmm. it's very common for producers common, to be yeah. mix engineers as well Bergstrand yeah. Daniel Bergstrand's a good example of that sometimes on some albums he'll just be the producer um, and then sometimes he'll produce and mix and that's the case for another guy uh, Dave Bottrell um, mm. who uh, was the producer for Lateralis by Tool, uh, Thrak I think by King Crimson, a mm -hmm. number of others. Yeah, yeah. Um, Daniel Bergstrand obviously has worked a lot with uh, In Flames and a lot of other Meshuggah. Uh, um, yeah, so there's some examples of some producers and generally what they do uh, mm. in the project. Um, so but a lot of bands do it themselves. Yeah. Like, some good examples of that are obviously Porcupine Tree and Stephen Wilson with his solo stuff. Uh, Devin Townsend, he's produced a lot of his own stuff. Yeah. Not all, but some. Yeah. Um, Radiohead. No, Radiohead always worked with. Um, oh, there's that what that guy? Yeah. I never remember. Uh, that yeah. <laughs> <They've always laughs> that guy. That guy. Yeah. yeah. So, so and then you got some you know, bands and some projects where you have co-producers. So the band will co-produce and and that's basically them, you know, sort of being very much involved in, in the tasks that are required of a producer. Uh, but they'll also have an external producer as well. So, you know, pretty much every amateur band or, you know, not really well-established band uh, self-produces. But then some, you know, quite high-profile bands, they choose to do it themselves. 
uh, and the reason you know the, the kind of there's some benefits to doing that and some drawbacks you know I think the benefit of doing it all yourself is that you, if you've got a really strong vision of what you want to achieve then you can even in terms of sound design right in terms mm. of how it should sound what it is every single part of it that you're trying to get and you've got the whole finished product in your mind from the beginning then it kind of makes sense for you to to do it yourself as long as you know what you're doing yeah, um, you know often I guess some bands I think wouldn't but Stephen Wilson does mm, I think a lot of people do it for just for having and that extra person who's slightly stepped back and away from it who's got a more objective view than the band who may have been working on it for months and months or years and years or whatever yeah. so it's kind of having another fresh set of ears and a different viewpoint which can be you know obviously very helpful and mm -hmm. it could inspire to take things in a slightly different direction or just help through any kind of writer's block kind of thing or anything like that and um, maybe even like ba internal struggles in the band because that's another thing and you know one of the benefits of having a producer is that yeah, they, be a they mediator. they'll weigh in and they'll yeah. they'll kind of be a mediator and mm. keep uh, the end result view of where you're trying to get to yeah, um, in mind because of course you can have a lot of potential struggles between mm -hmm. um, various different elements within any project you know even management the band the re the label uh, the mix engineer the mastering engineer you know you can have any number of different uh, conflicts and I think the producer would work as a mediator often in that mm. respect so yeah I mean I think if, if you have a really strong vision of what you're trying to aim for and um, you know how to actually get there so you know all of the different elements of what you have to do yeah, you I know think, I think it helps. Another one. Loads of different I think things. it helps to be um, if you're gonna self-produce I think it does help to have quite a bit of nouse with uh, music technology and the recording process and stuff, you know, being able to um, get the kind of things you're after without, you know, having the knowledge yourself is important. Is basically what I'm trying to say. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if, if you don't you know what you're doing, yeah, then if you don't know what you're doing, then it's probably pretty, best producer would be help. really helpful. Yeah, <laughs> get help. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I mean, effectively though. A lot of bands don't have the option to do that, and they don't know what they're doing, so <laughs> so they end up with with a crap well, result. I think but. also you get a lot of people that don't even really know what a producer is or does. Yeah. In a way. Probably. Um, which you know. Yeah. It's <laughs> probably not a good thing because then they're probably not doing the kind of things that a producer would be doing. Yeah. So true. Probably suffering. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, we're we're completely self-produced. And I think we always will be, really. Yeah, I think so. Um, we involved we involve Daniel Bergstrand for a specific task that we wanted him to, yeah, to complete for us. But, you know, we choose to self-produce because we have a very clear vision of what we actually want to achieve as an end result. Uh, even in terms of sound, you know, when we record the sounds, um, we kind of, we know how they're going to fit in eventually. Um, and uh, and artwork and everything about the album, it's just basically having a really clear vision from the beginning of where you want to end up and working through that process. So in effect, we're kind of doing that role of a producer ourselves just naturally. Mm -hmm. And and you can see that evolution because it, when you start off and you're fully 100% amateur band and don't really know what you're doing and don't really know, uh, you know, anything that's really involved in releasing an album, you, you're kind of, uh, you know, you're basically producing your own stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it can be an evolution from that point to actually starting to really know what you are doing, which is, of course, what Steve Wilson mm -hmm. went through because he's doing it for his own music. And, uh, and that's what we've done. It's gradually got better at all the different aspects that are required to, um, to finally get an album together. So, um, I think that's pretty... Is there anything else we want to say about it? Um, not really, I don't think. Producing I mean, your own music, well... Yeah, there's benefits and cons yeah, to it. Um, I mean, it's obviously a lot of work. Um, yeah. Outside of, 
you know, just being a musician and being an artist, you know, you have to, like from for us, I mean, we're we're essentially self-produced, self-managed, everything really. The only thing we outsourced was the mixing. Um, so yeah, there's a hell of a lot of stuff you have to get your head round and and understand and get mm. together. You know, you have to be quite motivated and driven. Definitely. Yeah, right. <laughs> definitely, yeah, uh, yeah, because it's it's uh, it's a lot of work, and that shows why you know it can help to have a producer. Another really important aspect or element of this consideration is the cost that's involved because producers cost, obviously they cost money, they don't yeah. work for free in general, um, you know, and they can take a cut of the royalties <coughs> that could be even as much as, you know, the band. Mm -hmm. So uh, it really depends on the producer and the deal, but, you know, you've got to bear that in mind that there is a cost associated with it. Um, so I guess that plays into it or can play into it. Um, so yeah, and I think we're done for that with that, with that topic. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have released our album now, uh, Logacharia. It is now out and for sale uh, on our website. All the links are gonna be in the description <coughs> as they always will be from now on probably. Um, so we've got this delivery of these digibooks uh, we have 1,000 of them. Well, we have... Oh no, less than... Now. Yeah, <laughs> less than 1,000 now, but we did have 1,000 of them. We've sold quite, quite a few. Um, and they are looking pretty good. Yeah, they're cool. Um, Dave actually burnt one of them earlier on. <laughs> I wanted to say that all, all the way through the, uh, the, uh, us making this album. I said the first one I opened, which was the one that it was, so I was going to burn it, so I did. And <laughs> it's on uh, it's on YouTube. Put it on there today, uh, and it's burnt. It is now burnt. So yeah. here's a few so of them. There's only 999 in existence. Uh, this is one that's without the cellophane. Um, so it's a digi book. It's looking good. Mm. Uh, and this is really badly done. <laughs> you get the idea. Dave did a much better video which we'll link to right now. Um, so we got these uh, CDs in a number of huge boxes. With lots of little boxes. With lots of these little boxes inside. Um, and this is what it looks like when you receive a big delivery of CDs. This is 25, so we got loads. Shall we, we'll put a picture up of the boxes that we got um, now. But yeah, this is one of many, basically. Uh, there we go. What's that? Um, okay. <laughs> so I think we're done for now for this uh, segment. We'll come back in a bit and talk about... Talk about In Absentia. By Porcupine Tree. Right, so as we mentioned before, we're going to talk about Porcupine Trees In Absentia, which is their 2002 album and it was their first album on kind of a much bigger label than they were on before which is Lava before they were on Snapper, K-Scope and they were on a different label before that but um, was this a 7th or 8th? 8th 8th eighth album and it was the one that kind of really made them much more well known they sold a lot more like multiples of times more than any of their other albums with this one mm -hmm. and it was also their first album with the drummer Gareth Gavin Harrison which um, in my opinion is probably quite a big part of it being such a leap because he's a exceptionally good drummer um, so the album it was released in uh, 2002 said that did you yep <laughs> did you really yeah. I wasn't listening, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, released in 2002, um, and you know, as you said, it, it was the, the eighth album, but I mean, it, it's such a massive shift from the previous albums, isn't it? Yeah, well it had a lot to do with, I'm just going to put this at the cam, in front of the camera, it had a lot to do with um, him meeting Michael Ackerfeld and Opeth, because he, um, he produced and mixed Blackwater Park a year before this album was released. Um, and I think they had quite a big influence on him, um, 
and clearly his music kind of he embr- he's always he's always said he he's got always good. been a big metal fan. No, no, no. <laughs> um, uh, he's always been a big metal fan, but he never really had much kind of metal elements in his music. And then also Gavin Harrison being a much more technical drummer than the previous guy they worked with. Um, it just got a little bit heavier, but still, still very proggy and very kind of poppy in a way. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a very good album. It was, it was actually Dead Wing, which was the album after, after that one. this one. Um, I think that was 2004 or five. I'm not too sure. It was around then. 2005. Yeah. Um, that was the first album I um, I listened to of Porcupine Tree when they released that. And Me then, too. And then I sort of got got this one later on. But you can definitely hear that this sounds a lot more like Deadwing, whereas their older albums, which I've got into subsequently, are much more. Um, I don't know, it's hard to explain. They're kind of more proggy and improvisational, um, more kind of 70s uh, sort of sound going on in them. And also a lot more, sounds like a bit of a um, a counterintuitive to say it, but it's a bit poppier in a way, like more uh, more easily listening, I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, Mm. This is more progressive metal Mm. oriented. Uh, so um, I'm going to give you some technical details. Uh, it was obviously produced by Stephen Wilson. That's why we're talking about it today in this vlog. Um, he is pretty much, in our opinion, a genius uh, in many different in different ways. Um, you know, and he he's produced the whole thing. Um, he didn't mix it, did he? No, he I didn't think mix it's the it. first album that he he didn't mix, mm-hmm. and then. Ever since then, he's mixed every other one. So, this was recorded <laughs> in Avatar Studios in New York. Mm. Um, I'll come back to that, but that's a, a very well-established uh, studio in New York. It was mixed by a guy called Mark O'Donaghy. O'Donaghy. Are you reading that? Yes, uh, and Tim Palmer. <laughs> Tim Palmer, guy who mixed Pearl Jam's Ten mm. album. And a number of others, some stuff from U2, who cares? Uh, you know, some small stuff. But, uh, but basically, um, oh, I'll just finish off. So mastered by a guy called Darcy Proper. Um, uh, in my opinion, the sound, the, the album sounds brilliant. It sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, I don't know about that. It sounds, it sounds nicely balanced to me in like, terms of EQ. Yeah, it's very, very crunchy. It's got a lot of clipping. Yes, it does have some it clipping. Clip some, it's got a lot of clipping. It clips all over the place. You can really hear it in the high end. Yeah, um, a lot of the heavy guitars sound really bad because of it, because they're just mm. crunching all the time. It's going yeah, it is. It is uh, pretty crunchy. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's, it sounds very, very good, and a lot of that is. I'd actually put more down to Stephen Wilson than the person who actually mixed it is you yeah. know the kind of sound designs the synth yeah. layers mm. um the kind of effects used and stuff you know the I really weird got a lot the, to do with the that. really weird thing about it is that it really still sounds like a Stephen Wilson production and that better than anything shows what a producer does if they've got their own yeah, style yeah, definitely. you know and and they've got their own kind of unique signature um you, you know what you can what i really notice is in terms of the mix just to say a few things is that there's not a lot of low end in the guitars which allows for the bass to be quite big and, and audible the guitars tend to be quite thin especially can compared to like your your uh, your average metal music mm-hmm. um there's a lot of uh, definition in the drums and this is really the start of that kind of iconic Gavin Harrison drum sound mm-hmm. and that's really down to close miking uh, and you know using the close mics which are mics that are right on the drums instead of room mics which would be placed further back which is interesting because Avatar Studios where this was recorded has one of the world's best drum rooms <laughs> which is like renowned for the for the room yeah, sound for of the, the big airy yeah, sound for the drums and uh, 
and it's not really used all that much in this album. It's kind of like it sounds, the drum sound sounds a hell of a lot like Dead Wing or mm -hmm. Fear of a Blank Planet, which is a, a much more kind of close mic sound. Um, interesting, it's just a mix decision. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of a hallmark of, um, of Stephen Wilson in general because it produces this kind of tight, refined, audiophile type sound. Mm -hmm. Everything's not just big and squashy and, you know, kind of all jumbled together. It's all quite, um, it's all quite segmented in terms of the mix. Mm -hmm. And I, and I really like that. I think it sounds, it sounds really good. Yeah. It's just a bit pushed. It's just a bit pushed. Yeah. In, in you mastering. can hear it. Um, I don't know. A lot of the acoustic guitars, for example, are just so flat, you know, like when they, there's the strummy kind of guitars. It, I don't know, it just doesn't sound good to me. <laughs> album has, on average, and of course this is just an average, but it has an average dynamic range of seven decibels. Um, it averages that. It, some tracks are six, some tracks are eight, and then even within the tracks, obviously, it's going to vary, so it's just an average. Just to give a, an idea of, of you know the levels of compression and what's going on in the mastering um so yeah it is it is pretty heavily compressed and you can really hear that in the crackly distorted artifacts that you that are in the high end yeah. um i think that that's it for the sound of the album what mm. about the, the well, kind of part track in the wise album? it's kind of there's there's a lot of a lot of it's kind of what I'd consider the new sort of porcupine tree sound that sort of started with this and then Deadwing and Fear of a Blank Planet and the Incident. And that, but on this, there's still some that sounds much more like the kind of older, less band type stuff when Stephen Wilson was working much more on his own. Yeah. Um, like Collapse the Light into the Earth, um, Heart Attack and a Lay By. They're much more stripped down, simpler less orchestrated things and much less rocky um, so you can kind of see that this, this is a sort of bridge as yeah. into them finding a kind of a sound a, that really works yeah well, well just becoming a band with it. the people because having well, Gavin the thing Harrison is, now, the let's just yeah Gavin Harrison is very much responsible yeah, I for think so. I, I think honestly so. think right I honestly think Gavin Harrison is really really heavily responsible for Porcupine Tree uh, overall, and then really kind of breaking into the mainstream, mm. because it's no coincidence that it's the first album that he was on. And there's an, there was an interview with uh, Stephen Wilson where he said that the rest of the band, <coughs> when they heard Gavin playing, they sort of felt like, okay, we've really got to up our game here, mm. because this guy's seriously good, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and he is one of the world's best drummers, amazing, amazing drummer. And you know, the drum parts were written before he actually <coughs> got involved, or they were programmed. But he obviously, you know, kind of reimagined them, and it's just the way that he articulates everything and plays everything that gives his sound. Well, he's got a lot of technique, and he's he's also very, very creative, and he's he can do very complex stuff. But he also serves the song really well all the exactly. time. He's so appropriate. Exactly. But when he needs to do, or when he wants to be a bit flashy, he's got all the chops to do it. But he, um, a lot of the time, he hangs back and he, and his parts really, really fit. What's going on? <coughs> I'm not Which is why I think he's one of the perfect drummers for for King Crimson. Yeah, no, true. Because that's what they really need. Mm. Um, uh, that live. Um, I've got a, an album of a live gig they did, um, which I think they called called the Live Recording Electric. I think. I can't. It's, 2006 or something, mm -hmm. maybe a bit later than that, but with two drummers, with um, they Thomas often had Loto two drummers and, and yeah. Gavin Harrison, that's very, very cool. <clears throat> I remember seeing Porcupine Tree live. Um, and Which one, album was that, the tour of? Uh, Deadwing. Mm -hmm. um, and they had Robert Fripp supporting them, um, which was very good for me. I thought I really enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> one of my friends who wasn't really a porcupine tree fan at the time, but um, I persuaded them to come along. Who so happens to have quite a following on YouTube, his name is Drew James, and we may as well link to his channel right now, here. <laughs> but anyway, um, <coughs> he said to me, like, they sort of set 
uh, Gavin Harrison's kit up. And over the hi hat, he had this little collection of about five, like tiny little splashes, or what would you call them? Yeah, they are splashes, aren't they? I suppose even it's like tiny bell, bell symbols. Bell symbols. Yeah. And he had about five of them there, and he and Andy turned to me and said, "He's never going to use them." And I, it was so <laughs> funny because the first thing he did is he basically did this really complex fill was the first thing he did on the kit and counted the band in on all of these in one go. <laughs> and into it and I was just laughing my head. It's very good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, they're an awesome live band. Um, they, they, I can't remember his name now, but they always have another guitarist live. Mm. Um, it's always the same guy. He's never played on any of the records, but he always tours with them. Um, because he does a lot of a lot of the backing vocals as well. He's got a really really good voice. He's probably actually got a better voice than Stephen Wilson. Most people um, do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. But yeah, if you haven't heard in absentia, definitely check it out. It's a very very good album. And also check out Dead Wing and Fear of Blank Planet and the Incident. Mhm. Mm and Stephen Wilson's solo stuff as well, which is all very good. I mean, for, I'm for me, this is where the band came into their own. For me, this was the start of the of porcupine tree you know in there yeah, as they exist as now. they exist now and also it's kind of like when they really found their sound and everything just kind of came together for them um and it's just been you know kind of brilliant release after brilliant release mm. since then i'm just wondering when they're going to do the next one really because it's been quite a while since the incident when was that um, 2009 and then stephen wilson's basically released yeah. Three solo albums since then. Well, yeah, that's your problem. <laughs> well, I don't know. Did he do Insurgents before The Instant came out? I think they were the same year, actually. Mm -hmm. And then he's done two solo albums since then and toured with that band. So <coughs> hopefully they are going to uh, do more. Who knows? Hopefully. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Uh, so let's give the album a rating out of ten, as we always do. Ten. Should I go first? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give it seven. Okay, I'd probably give it a six. Okay. Although, I mean, there's some songs on here that are really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. I just think there's a few weak moments in it, and I'm not too fond of the mix. But it's got some excellent songs on You're it. You're not too fond of the mastering? Mm, yeah, I suppose so. Well, what do you think about the heavy guitar sound? Uh, it's alright. <laughs> <laughs> it's very crunchy and messed up. But yeah. It's, yeah. Um, well, the thing is, they're not really. They have metal elements, but they're not really metal. It's more, you know, rock. Really. Rock, yeah. Um, but I think this was. Uh, like we said, it's kind of them finding their feet in a way. Mm. And Deadwing, which is the one that follows this, is an excellent album, which mm -hmm. I'd probably give a nine. <laughs> um, You're giving it away. <laughs> yeah, well. But this is this is a very, very good album. The first sort of three tracks are really good. There's a few weak ones. And one of my favourite actual Porcupine Tree tracks ever is, is actually Heart Attack and a Lay-By, which is a very low-key... Um, very subdued, quiet, melancholic song, and it's brilliant. It has this kind of vocal round thing where it's layered vocals, and it's it's really, really, really cool. Mm. Yeah, I just I just find some songs on here a little bit uh, cheesy, cheap and cheesy. I don't cheap know. and cheesy. Yeah. It's like some I don't know because for me I don't think. Yeah, but that, that's kind of like, to be honest with you, I think that was the hallmark of Porcupine Tree before this. And no, this no, it's when he's trying to do the kind of more heavy stuff where it kind of goes wrong. Yeah, I but think. nevertheless, it was kind of an element in their sound, like that, that there was a bit of cheesiness mm. before this. Um, and that cheese came through, <coughs> <laughs> you know, to this album a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good album. It's worth, if, I mean, I, I definitely get it if you're into progressive metal because it's an yeah, it's important got, album. It's got great, beautiful sounds in it and lovely sort of soundscape elements and 
all these kind of really interesting layers and and things. Yeah. It's, it's a very, very good album. Probably being a bit harsh giving it a six, but I have very high standards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, um, I think that's it. Would we have any band updates? Other than the fact that we've well, actually released our album for sale. Yeah, well, I think that's it really. It's, that's what most of the last sort of few weeks have been setting up the shop and mm. sorting being stuff busy. out with the site and this whole stuff, the back end of everything really. Yeah, being busy and that's why we uh, slightly delayed um, with this vlog release. We um, try to do one a week uh, on the weekend, every week. And you'll probably be seeing uh, quite a few more videos from us actually. We're going to focus on uh, a few different areas, you know, production and mixing and gear stuff mm. as well. Yeah, definitely. So that's it for today and see you again in slightly less than a week. Yeah. Bye. Later. <laughs>